Hey guys, welcome back to the Another Excuse podcast. Today I'm joined by Matt Rod, the co-founder of the eBusiness Institute and the co-host of the Digital Investors podcast. Matt acquires, scales, and sells online businesses, and that's exactly what our conversation is about today. In this episode, we discuss why online businesses are better than brick and mortar businesses, what to look for when buying a business and how to do it, and Matt's journey and what motivated him to get started. Let's get into it. Hi, Matt. Thanks for joining me today. To dive right in, how would you describe what you do? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Byron. It's awesome to be here. Um, we, my Normally, it's my wife and I. So the two of us are business partners, have been for over 30 years now, and we just buy and sell businesses. That's what we've done basically as our career since we met. Um, And these days, we buy and sell online businesses, so websites, um, and we we absolutely love it. And we teach people what we do there as well. Great. And why would you say buying... A website is more attractive investment than a physical business. Yeah, that's a really good question. So as you just heard, our career is, has been full-time entrepreneurs buying and selling all sorts of businesses. And we also did it in M&A, like as business brokers. So we were working with high net worths um, and we're selling businesses up to about 20 mil. And what we learned the reason we did that was a learning journey and we were always looking for what Liz and I always, always wanted was financial freedom and time freedom. And that's why we got into business rather than doing the traditional thing of, you know, going to, even though we went to uni, but going to uni, getting a job and all that sort of stuff and buying real estate, that that was not our thing. And so what we learned, we went on this journey, we're totally self-taught in business and we were always after the ideal model that would let us move back to the country because we're both from the country and raise our family, work whatever hours we want and become financially independent. That's what it was all about. So we never had to work a nine to five. And through that, we hung out with a lot of entrepreneurs, very, very successful entrepreneurs who are quite private people who did exactly what we wanted to do, buy and sell businesses. And we learn over the years, what are the really good business models? And this is why your question is so interesting to us and why we're so passionate about it, because you're saying what makes online businesses better than bricks and mortar businesses? It is chalk and cheese. If you are a young entrepreneur, I wish the internet was around when we started in business. So, you know, or, or you could do what we can do now online, because out of all the thousands, and it is literally thousands of businesses that we've looked at, not we haven't bought thousands ourselves, but we've done due diligence on thousands of businesses. All we ever talk about is business. All our friends are business people. You know, we've been doing this compounding. You know, talk about ten thousand hours, man. We want to whatever <laughs> thirty years is looking at business deals. Byron and anyone listening, seriously, listen to me now. If you are thinking of getting into business, you would be absolutely insane to not get into an online business. It is so much easier compared to bricks and mortar. And when we discovered the online space, so back here around, it was before the GFC, so around, so we we're, were obviously understanding how the internet worked and everything like that, but we could see that you could make money online sort of in the early 2000s, but we didn't know how to do it. We were two kids from the country. We were, we were buying and selling our manufacturing businesses back then and wholesale import businesses. We were kind of, had no idea how to do the tech stuff. It was very difficult. So we kind of put it off. But seriously, buying online businesses, when we did figure it out, we realized, you know, we'll know what the biggest advantage is. So our background is wholesale, import, or manufacturing businesses. We live in Australia. You can probably tell from my accent. And I'm telling you, Australia's a long way from anywhere. at The other end of the earth. And so when you're in whole physical inventory style businesses, it is really challenging because we've got the tyranny of distance. Online, there's none of that. 
there are no borders. So the minute we got online, we literally started making money in America. And yet here we were in Australia in our Jimmy Jams working off laptops or not laptops back then. It was on PCs. Um, you know, so we had all of a sudden no borders, 24 seven marketplace, and we had access into the holy grail for entrepreneurs, the best market on the planet, which is the U S sorry, Byron. I know you're, you're from South Africa. Of course, South Africa is awesome. We used to, we used to, um, deal with manufacturers in South Africa. And also I know you live in London, which is, I know any of you listening, you're probably British. But seriously, the, the, the marketplace for online stuff is America. There's over 300 million people there. It's a very mature market. It's really easy to tap into even very niche markets and make a fortune, literally. And it, so, you know, for us and for if you're listening, the reason why I go through that, why I'm, I've been there and done it and all my friends have been there and done it. You know, we're all, I live and breathe business. And to this day, I have not seen a business model that is as effective as an having an online-based business model for those reasons, because it's 24-7, worldwide, no barriers whatsoever, and it's just electrons. You, you don't, it, it, the sort of businesses we're buying and selling online, we don't deal with end customers. There's no interaction whatsoever. They're all automated. So it's, it's really easy. So um, <laughs> unlike the old days of bricks and mortar businesses. Yeah, I, well, I think everyone would agree and understands that the US is the most thriving online business opportunity. Oh, yeah. And and so now you can get access to it from anywhere in the world. So a lot of our clients, you know, they are like your age and they're doing the laptop lifestyle thing. They're living in different countries for, you know, six months at a time. They've got total freedom for, from that. So that's what I love about online businesses. It gives you absolute freedom in so many ways, not just financial freedom, but geographic freedom and time freedom and massive leverage in that when it, we, everything's virtual. So we can, when we hire staff, they're just in, you know, they're from like the Philippines or wherever, or from India or, or from the um, Eastern European countries. It, it's brilliant. You just get the, as long as you're happy to get up a little bit earlier to talk to them on Zoom, it's not a problem. Yeah. And what do you look for when buying a business? I feel like there's a lot of information out there. And... There's a lot there. Yeah. There's a lot of things, but we're, we're looking, what, what we kind of do is like buying real estate. Uh, now I'm not a fan of buying real estate, but because uh, I believe in the cash flow of business, but we do a, I've got to admit, we do a similar strategy where we buy, I guess you'd call it, you know, the worst street in the best area, the worst house in the best street, sorry. And you're looking for renovation opportunities. So we want to do simple renovations where we can turn it around reasonably quickly. When I say reasonably, it still takes about a year. That may sound slow to you young guys, but to us from traditional business backgrounds, most businesses, bricks and mortar businesses will take you a decade to turn around or five years plus till you start getting massive, the exponential returns. Whereas websites, we can do it in about a year to two years. So where, so it's not a, you still can make really good money from day one, but to really get what we really want is the, the ones that have been neglected, their passion sites, their genuine sites. And we just come in, we do a quick makeover and then we work on them over 12 months and fix them up and, and either double or triple the um, profits we get out of them. And what I should mention, Byron, is for anyone listening People hear about us buying and selling online businesses. What it's not, what we don't buy is probably the most important question, and that is e-commerce sites. I do not recommend that. I'm passionate about it because you heard my background is manufacturing or businesses with physical inventory. As a young entrepreneur, I can tell you now, if you've got to put money into physical stock, like you know widgets sitting on a shelf somewhere, even if they're in an Amazon store, um, it'll hold you back like nothing else because all your cash flow has got to keep going back into stock. And if you can't sell it, you're stuffed. So, and it's just complexity that you don't need. So we, when we got online, Liz said to me, or the two of us made a pact, we are never going back to physical inventory or, you know, businesses with physical stock. So all we do is we only buy and sell online businesses that are, that are advertising or sell leads. That's it. So th there's Perfect. no risk to us whatsoever. If we, if we, that you don't have to invest into, you don't have to keep putting money into stock all the time. So the, 
the margins are huge at eighty percent quite often. So you you know, and you can get you get massive returns on your money because like it's instant cash flow compared to having to put money into physical inventory. So if you're listening to this and you're interested in getting in online, I know there's lots of courses out there that teach you how to make lots of money from e-commerce and it's all they're all good. We've got friends that make a lot of money from e-commerce, but Liz and my rule is we don't touch e-commerce. And I'd recommend if you're new to this, don't touch it because it's just complexity you don't need. Um, I know it's tempting. People love physical stuff for some reason, but we don't. We do, As entrepreneurs, we're, uh, we have a saying in, in our house here, we teach it to our kids, cash flow is king. That's all we're looking for. I don't want to be... I don't want to go back to those days of tying up all my money in a warehouse somewhere. Yeah. And by advertising, do you mean that it's like a blog or something like that yep. where they are selling advertising on the website? Yep. Yep. Okay. So basically, a, yeah, a blog, like a, that's how most people think of it. Yeah. As a blog. Yeah. So it might be like a, a travel blog. So just say you're a travel, you know, you got a travel blog or a crafting blog or a blog about gardening. So, um, and then what people come there looking for answers. So that's how we make money online. We, we, we provide answers to people's questions and so, and get a bit of a following as well. And then when people are there, they take an action. They either click on an ad. So we get paid. So that's automated. So we money in the bank while you sleep. That's what we loved first. That's how we made most of our money. When we first got online, we absolutely love that. Um, so money just turns up in your bank account. Well, these days it's once a month. Um, from Google, but basically when people click on an ad, you get paid or affiliate links. If people click on, you recommend a certain product, people click on that link, they're cookied. And if they buy that product from Amazon, then instead of us having to provide the product, we just get a commission, which is beautiful. Absolutely love that. It's a really smart business model. They might get 20% commissions or something like that, but you don't have any of the risk of the products. Yeah. And uh, just to get into the weeds a bit, like what kind of changes are you making to these websites to get that exponential growth? The main one is the, it, uh, there's two things it's, that would boil down to in essence. I mean, there's a, there's a lot to it. This is why we teach people this stuff. There, there's like, it's cool. It's not, it's not hard. It's a lot of fun, but it takes time, a bit of time to learn it at first if you've never done it before. But essentially it boils down to fixing up the monetization, so profits and then traffic. We live and breathe by profits and traffic. In fact, that's what we do when we're doing due diligence on a website too. You'll often see when sites are for sale, that the main metrics that they that sellers quote are how much money they make each month, which makes sense, and but also the traffic, the eyeballs, so the people that are coming to the site. So traffic's an interesting one in this day and age, especially with all the Google updates. Um, yeah. It's not just the, the volume of traffic, it's the quality of the traffic and the reliability of the traffic. That's what we're looking for. And then the main changes that we're doing is, I guess, SEO based, but not only that, it's also building lists or newsletters or things like that. But the other main changes on the profitability side is things like <laughs> the classic is putting your prices up or getting better affiliate offers or better ad, ad advertising rates. And you might get direct advertisers. So, I mean, one, one of the, I guess, one of the great examples that I love is Lisa, who was on our program. She was a, a stay-at-home mum, and she did our course. She bought a simple Amazon, what's called an Amazon affiliate site, and just recommending exercise equipment. And she bought it for a couple of grand, and she got it to making $1,000 a month net profit just off affiliate offers. Now, that sounds pretty cool. But it went way better than that because what she did was once it started to get successful, this is where things snowball. She added more content. It ranked heaps better. She could then negotiate better. She found better affiliate offers than the Amazon affiliate offers. Now, Amazon's great, but it does only pay 4 or 5% commissions. So she just went direct to the manufacturers in America and said, do you have um, affiliate programs? And they said, yep. And so she was getting you know, 10% affiliate commissions, double what she was getting on Amazon. So then she got the site up to making around five grand a month. And then it went better than that again. This is net profit, $5,000 a month. She's had months where it's gone over $30,000. That's before Christmas and at the peak time. And that's net profit. Now that site, that little tiny site is a six to seven figure site. Like one of the brokers that 
one of our conferences said, if you let me sell it now, I'll sell that thing for a million dollars. And that was a site that cost a couple of grand. Now that's taken many years. People focus on the numbers. It's really exciting. But the concept is what she did, she fixed up all the traffic on there. And it was in the health niche. That's a really good niche where people are interested in staying healthy. But then the main thing that she did was just get heaps better affiliate offers on there, much higher payouts. And, you know, in a, in a trending time, particularly during COVID, it went really well because everyone wanted exercise equipment. So she made a fortune. Easy. <clears throat> That's a great story. And you mentioned Google Ads, and I yep. know they're making a whole lot of changes, particularly with cookies. Is that something yeah. you worry about at all? No, because the numbers are so big. So it is an issue, admittedly. And now people, it, it is interesting. I know what you mean. And it's funny, Byron, us oldies don't worry about it because we don't care about cookies and stuff. We just hit, yeah, I'll, I'll, whatever. Whereas I know a lot of people in your age group are worried about it. So in our community, we get that question a lot. That's a really good question. And I notice you guys are probably smarter than us, you millennials or you younger guys, because a lot of you use ad blockers and stuff. Now, I don't. I love seeing ads out of professional curiosity. It's how I make my money. So I never, ever, if you're listening to this, if you want to get online, never turn off your ad blockers because you want to see what your competitors are doing. You want to see what all the ads are. It's fascinating. This is how you make money online. But I know what you mean. Um, so on the surface, you know, you hear a lot of people in your age group using ad blockers a lot more. And it's funny. We've watched this over the years. It hasn't actually impacted that much on the bottom line of websites that we've seen. And we look at literally I every single day I'm doing due diligence on websites, looking at AdSense revenues. You get I get to see in the bank accounts, everything. And and also with our own sites, our client sites, our friend sites. Honestly, the, the AdSense revenues are the same. They haven't gone down. And what you got to think about is Google, you, you got to look at the big see your human brain can't conceptualize large numbers, right? And so I come from a science background. That's what I did at uni, zoology. You know, like, go figure. Then here I am an entrepreneur <laughs> anyway. Um, but you can't, us humans can't conceptualize big numbers. And let's look at the reality of the situation here. We're talking Google, right? Google is the, currently the fourth largest company on the planet. What, what to do? 86 billion last year or something. Now, you and I, I don't care how smart you are, unless you're in the finance world, you probably can't even conceptualize a billion dollars, like a billion or a billion data points, what that looks like. I'm okay up to about a mil, up to maybe 20, 50 mil, because that's what I work around. But once you get beyond data sets, beyond that, humans can't conceptualize it. And here's my point with this. People worry about a segment of the market switching off their ad, switching on ad blockers. Google, they just announced, how long ago? What, a month ago, announced their um, financial results for the last quarter. Record results yet again. You know, 70, I think Google still to this day, it's around 75% of their revenues, so, you know, 86 billion, 75% still comes from AdSense. That's even with people turning off their ad blockers. And you tell me, there's no way Google's going to let go of that that money that's large yeah that that's a it, it, the, the the wealth and abundance out there online is absolutely mind-blowing i don't my point out of all this is be careful of overthinking um these things like our oh, ad blockers are, are cutting out the market look at how much just go and look at how much money google makes out of adsense that's not going to stop in a hurry well they're not going to let that go lightly and if it does we just adapt because there's way more ways to make money out of a website. So I don't actually care. If I see that the AdSense drops down, I just put more affiliate offers on or I'll get direct advertisers on there. Easy. So there's always right. a way. It's still heaps better than bricks and mortar businesses. You've got to put it in perspective. When you own a bricks and mortar business, you know, little things do affect you in a major way, particularly as a small business owner. Like we nearly went bankrupt so many times because little things would affect you. Online, we'll lose a website, we'll lose traffic. Stuff, stuff happens. We call it IT happens. It rhymes with a swear word. You know, <laughs> it happens. And, but it doesn't take you out because you just buy another website or you find a way because there's so much traffic. You can go into these little tiny micro niches. niches. I'm amazed. One of our mentors said to us many years ago, when you get online, 
as Matt, you can find people that are interested in all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff and make money out of it. And it'll seem impossible. So Byron, we, we own a website about pigeon racing. Now, whilst I studied zoology at uni, I have no idea to this day, I don't even look at the website, but it still ticks along making a thousand bucks a month. Now that's not a particularly big site for us or anything like that. It's a, it's a really, it's one of our smaller sites, but the point is it's done that for a decade. It's a lot of money in this yeah. weird micro niche that I know nothing about that I laughed at Liz when she bought it. I said, why are you buying, like who's in the pigeon racing? The thing gets, I think it gets 50,000 visitors a month. I would oh. never have thought there were that many people on the planet interested every single month coming to a site about bloody pigeons. Like who would have <laughs> thought? So it, yeah. that that's my point. It, it, what we've found compared to bricks and mortar business the abundance online, the numbers are, are, are mind boggling. You know, I've seen students buy simple little starter sites for 20 grand that have 80,000 visitors a month. You try and pitch a, a talk about data sets, you know, you know, I, I speak on stage and yeah, it's mind blowing when you speak to just a thousand people, imagine 80,000 a month coming to your website on autopilot every single month. That's that, geez, that's a lot of people. For 20 grand, that, that you could never do that with a retail store. Pretty exciting stuff. That is. And do you think acquiring an online business is attainable for most people? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's heaps easier now than it was 10 years ago. So even with the, and I know there's a lot of fear out there around, you know, some of your listeners may not be aware, but some of your listeners will be, is like the Google updates and AI obviously is a game changer, right? And, but again, big numbers, you got to think there's, the internet is here to stay. I think we can safely say that. And I think we can safely say online businesses are here to stay, right? They're not going to, in 10, 20 years time, online businesses are still going to be around. Of course, they're going to have to evolve. So we just evolve with them. You know, from our, you know, back when we started online, you couldn't do what you can do now with websites, especially if you're a non-techie person. So anyone can... And this is what we specialize in doing. We specialize in teaching total beginners, particularly technophobes, people who are scared of computers, who don't. That was me years ago. I come from the country. I wasn't, I didn't like computers. Um, Liz is different. She's really good on computers, but she's still so, totally self-taught. But what that means is, I, I believe anyone can do this, but you've got to learn a bunch of stuff. But literally now, mo most website building is click and drag. We use WordPress, anyone listening. Um, there's just certain business skills that you need to learn. And the main skill is knowing how to do good due diligence, knowing what you're looking for. And that's when you find the bargain sites or the opportunities out there. So absolutely, it's a really good question, you know, and I understand a lot of people think, yeah, could I actually do this? I'm telling you, it's way easier than bricks and mortar businesses, heaps easier and way lower risk because you can learn. So Byron, if you want to learn how to do it, you just start with something small, like a something, a site under five grand. I mean, if you can't afford that, you probably shouldn't be in business anyway. Okay. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. And uh, you mentioned that you've got to know what you're looking for and do the correct due diligence. Um, yeah. But uh, if you were starting from the beginning, how would you yep. approach buying an online business? Yeah, really good question. I. I think what I just said, uh, it's actually one of our golden rules we have here at the eBusiness Institute is when, if you want to get into this, when you're starting, I don't care how much money you've got, just buy your first site, start out really small. So when you, because when you hear me talk about it, it's really exciting. Well, I hope it is if you're listening this far, you know, and you're going to go to a website broker, you're going to see all these really cool websites and they're going to sound amazing. Like, you know, replace your job type money. You know, you could buy it and own it tomorrow type thing. Sounds unreal, but don't do that because you don't know what you're doing. It would be really dumb. If you've never owned an online business, there is a lot to learn at first. Um, you, we don't recommend you do that. What we recommend is calm down and buy a small site and just treat it as a, it's like in the startup world, a proof of concept thing so that you can get some runs on the board and understand how it works. There's no risk. You're risking a couple of grand at the most or whatever, or five grand. And you get to play on it, learn all the skills. It's exactly the same skill set anyway when you go onto a bigger site and then you just start to step it up. So if I was starting out today, that's what I would do. Well, I'll give myself a plug. If I was starting out today, I would learn how to 
you know, do a course or something on how to buy and do due diligence on websites. But honestly, your first step is is just buy a really small, little tiny micro site and play with it. Don't expect to make money off it. It's just about, you can resell it anyway for what you paid or a bit more. So you've got nothing to lose. That's how I'd do it. It's just safe. It, see, that's a cool thing. See, in the past, when I was a broker for bricks and mortar businesses, if someone wanted to um, you know, start out in a bricks and mortar world, they're up for 50 grand minimum just to even make a little bit of money. That's a fair bit of money if you're a young entrepreneur. Or normally you're up for six figures. Normally it's 100,000 plus. Whereas with websites, you can just get started for under five grand and have some fun and learn it and do it part-time while you're still working. So that'd be yeah. my other bit of advice. Don't quit your day job. Do this <laughs> as a side hustle first. That's my other main bit of advice there. Great. That's great advice. And I'd like to rewind, rewind the clock a bit um, and yep. ask how you got started in all of this. Um, did you always want to be an entrepreneur? I did, but Liz didn't, which is interesting. So she was pretty happy, but luckily for her, she met me. I like to say that. Well, she says that <laughs> as well. Um, I could, she's from the country. So we met at uni and we were actually destined to be um, Australia's leading experts on red kangaroos. I was doing honours in zoology and so was Liz on red kangaroos here in Australia. And we we're working out in remote rural Australia. It was unreal. Sound, sounds really good. But what happened was... We suddenly, because we're from the country, we wanted, that's what we thought we wanted. But when you're a zoologist, you're at the whim. The only way you can work is basically for the government, you know, or, or get grants. And you're typically in a lab or in the city somewhere. You're not actually, it's pretty rare that you get to go out in remote areas. So, um, and I said to Liz, well, I've always wanted to own my own business. Um, I, I grew up quite poor and I don't like it and working nine to five doesn't appeal to me um, because I know I can't get rich doing it that way. Um, I looked around at people working nine to five. I didn't know anyone what I would consider rich. So um, I said, let's get into business. So that's what we did. We got a small, we got an opportunity to buy a small manufacturing business with the help of friends and family. And it was awesome. It was really cool. We're addicted straight away. That was the thing. That's what made us quit uni because we, we got into it and we realized we had a couple of major problems on our hand. One was we overpaid for the business and the due diligence. We, we had no idea what we're doing and we relied on the, the advice of, an, of a well-meaning accountant, but he just, he had no idea either. Most accountants, would you believe Byron, and this is my experience, no disrespect to accountants if you're listening, but most accountants are useless at doing due diligence on businesses. They don't really know the true practical value of a business. So that started, I guess you call a lifelong obsession with nailing due diligence and understanding how to value businesses because we messed it up so much on that first one, nearly went bankrupt. And, um, but for us back then, we were young and stupid and absolutely loved it. We were totally addicted. And we realized very quickly, literally, I think within 48 hours, we figured out this thing can make us seriously rich. This is, um, but you know, 10 years later, it, it doesn't happen overnight, but it 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 was pretty eye opening to say the least when we got into it and figured out what was going on. But it was also pretty darn scary because we were nearly going bankrupt. Um, we'd put everything on the line, and luckily we figured out how to turn it around. And the way we did it, we just started reading books and listening. Back then, I would have listened to your podcast. You know, we that we just were self taught. We listened to tapes. They were tapes back then from business people and particularly sales people. And we realized we just had to turn around a business through sales because we didn't know any other way. That was it. Because we had no we had no business plan whatsoever except that. So we just figured, right, how do you how do you sell? So we started listening to American sales trainers and it worked. Worked really, really well. Um it was mind blowing. Like it, it it took a long time. And the biggest challenge was again, coming back to what I said at the beginning of the podcast, if you're listening to this, please hear me here. Our biggest challenge was constantly having to deal with stock. So we'd sell it. So our margins were 50, were 100%. So we'd buy a widget for a dollar and we'd sell it for two bucks and we'd sell it to wholesalers. Sounds unreal. Sounds like you're making heaps of money. It doesn't work that way. You don't get the cash on after tax and everything and trying to manage that cash flow over a year. No matter how, and especially once your business starts growing, it just sucks up more and more cash. And you need even more margins. And we had to keep going to the bank to reborrow. 
and um, we were right on the edge that whole time, but we loved it. And we got to the point where we could free ourselves up with that business and we we're really good at systemizing. So that's why we started buying and selling other businesses. And yeah, it, 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 we got really good at it. I've compressed a big part of our journey to a very short, what sounds like a short time frame. If you're listening to this, please understand that was like a 20 year journey, what I just described there. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, thanks for that. And you did put it into perspective as how difficult it was. And yeah. one thing that stood out for me was the importance of sales. Um, yeah. And Huge. Like, could you just go into a bit more detail as to like what kind of sales or why it made such an impact on your business yeah. and how you've carried that on throughout your career? I, yeah, cool question. Um, it's something we're really passionate about because, like I said, we didn't know enough about business, luckily, to worry about what the accountant said we needed to f fix up was, you know, cutting costs and managing inventory and all that sort of stuff. We're kind of looking at going, the bottom line is we go bankrupt no matter what happens here unless we get more sales. So I was just very simplistic and I said to Liz, um, we've got to like figure out how to sell all this stock. We've inherited it here like you know, by buying this business. There it is sitting on the shelves. It was a mess. We had to fix it all up and we just go, we've got to sell this thing and I don't know how to do it. So we learn off um, the American sales trainers, Tom Hopkins, Brian Tracy and Zig Ziglar. And if your listeners make, just go and Google them. If you want to feel good, you want to feel hypo, go and listen to Zig Ziglar. Makes you feel good. That's how you start. That's how we used to start the day, listening to Zig Ziglar um, tape session. But it actually worked really well because it, we were selling parts in the outdoor power equipment here in Australia. So parts for chainsaws and brush cutters and stuff. And so here we are, these two young kids turning up at the likes of, have you heard of Husqvarna and Honda? and Makita, you know, those big brands, we'd go door knocking and we'd get somehow figure, we'd read these books and they'd say, you know, do this for prospecting. All right, we'll do that. And it bloody worked. It was really, it was really cool. And they'd never had a, a manufacturer turn up and demonstrate to them how these products work. And so we just gradually got to know every single, what's called OEM manufacturer here in Australia and then overseas as well. We started exporting. But we got our brush cutter heads on on some of the biggest brands in Australia. And that was a real buzz for us. But it was through what you just asked, Byron, through good old fashioned sales work. So prospecting and then talking with going straight to the top to the CEOs. And that's who we that's who we would talk to. And and we were scared witless. I, I wasn't as confident as what I am now. I was very unconfident. And I can remember I got my first big deal with Honda Australia and I, I rang up the secretary down there. They were in another state in Australia and they had no idea who I was and I was that nervous. And I'm trying to explain what we did to this secretary. She said, oh, and I said, well, it'd be great if I could speak to your CEO. And she goes, hang on, I'll put you through to him. And I'm just like, what? That's not meant to happen. She's meant to be a gatekeeper. So I get on the phone and here's the CEO, this is Mr. Honda Australia, like the <laughs> head dude of Honda Australia. This is a big deal. And I actually um, lost my voice. Like I started stuttering and stammering. And I think he just felt sorry for me because I said, I'm a young guy. We've got this business, but he, we do really good. We've got a really good product. We're really good at it. And you can see our heads on these things anyway. He said, next time you're down in Melbourne, drop in and come and see me. I think he was just intrigued. Who's this stuttering young guy? <laughs> and so I, I said, I'll bring my wife. And um, we turn it up and he brought us in and he just turned out to be a super nice guy. And because we'd done all the sales training, literally it was an eight hour drive to get there. We listened to Tom Hopkins, the American sales trainer. He's a really nice guy. And Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy, they're really nice you know, they don't swear, they're, they're super nice people and they just have good old fashioned sales training techniques. We listened to it nonstop on that eight hour journey, walk in and we got the deal. Biggest deal ever it, at that time. Basically all our heads were put on the brand new model of um, brush cutters coming out to Australia. And it was, it was just mind blowing that it happened. And then we got to export because of that. Basically, that then led to the next sale, which led to the next sale, which led to the next sale. And 
the reason why I, I love sales is because not only did we figure out that's what we needed to do to turn around, along the journey, we start made a point of networking with high net worth, very successful entrepreneurs who are also manufacturers like us and, and the wholesale importers. And they all said to us, guess what they said, Byron, number one bit of advice, hmm. sales, you got to get out and hustle. And even in manufacturing and the wholesale distribution, you've got to show your face and sell. And it's a number one way to increase the business. Every single one of them that we studied and we go and hang out with them, we go to their factories, you know, they show us their amazing factories with all their equipment and all the, the you know, forklifts, all that sort of thing. At the end of the day, how you grow on this thing, more sales, more sales, more sales. And that flows through these days to online businesses. We teach this. It's exactly the same thing. Do you want to know what the real secret behind success with online sales is or online businesses is um, face to like networking, getting out there and talking to people. So even though you're in a micro niche like pigeon racing, if we really want that site to go really big, what we need to do is go and talk to professional pigeon racers, affiliate managers, you know, people, vets that supply vitamins. And in a way that's sales skills. So that's why sales, most people, if you're listening to this and you're a young guy or a young lady person, um, no, I don't care if you're in corporate or whatever, do it as a side study thing. Don't go and do an MBA. That's a waste of money. Sorry, I'm just going to be blunt about it. Why would you spend 50 grand doing an MBA? <laughs> You'll make way more money if you're good at sales. Go and learn, go and study sales courses and then get into a side hustle. They're probably the two key money-making or wealth-generating skills you could ever do if you're a young person. That would be my, that's my number one bit of advice these days to young people wanting to do stuff. Keep your day job, that's fine. But start a side hustle and learn how to sell because it will, at some point in your business career, you have to be able to sell. Super, super important. I don't care what sort of business you go into. And it will make you, at the very least, if you're good at sales, it'll make you a fortune in, in corporate anyway. The yeah. highest paid, my mum used to say, my mum was a, a, the secretary in, um, in corporate businesses. And she used to say, like I'd say to her when I was a kid, I don't want to make lots of money. And she'd go, well, any business I've ever worked for, she'd say the highest paid people, sometimes more than the boss, was the salespeople. Why don't you become a salesman? I said, all right, I'm going to do that. And then I figured out later in life, no, no, that you still got to work nine to five. I'm going to get a business instead and learn how to sell on top of it. But she's right. You know, the, the highest, sometimes the highest paid people in corporate are, th are the top salespeople. So number one skill, if you want to make lots of money, learn how to sell. Great. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, sales is so important, even if it's just selling yourself. Um, like for, yeah. this, for this podcast where I'm trying to get yep. guests on, um, I've got yep. to sell what my podcast is about and sell myself and why someone should sit down with me for an hour. It's you're always yeah, selling. You're always and you do a great job, Byron. It is important. That's why I'm on here because you sold yourself to me, you know, and what the podcast was about and what you're doing. You're right. That's why I'm on here. And and you, who knows where your podcast is going to lead to? That's the other thing that my mum taught me. She said, you <laughs> never know what doors open up for you. You've got to get out there and have a go at stuff because you never know what happens down the track. And so like for you starting this podcast, Seriously, it is your number one skill outside of being able to interview people is being able to sell because you've got to, yeah. you've got to sell the idea of it out there. And yeah, exactly. that could parlay, is that a word? You know, well, you could yeah. use that into an online business. What if you bought a business then that, you know, was an affiliate for business courses or something like that? Now you've got two vehicles. You've got a podcast and an online business, but they both still rely heavily around the ability to be able to sell. So yes. I, I think one, one of the things that's funny, people do our courses and they think they want to learn how to buy and sell websites, but we end up teaching them how to sell. When I do private coaching with people, one of my key things is a lot of people don't know how to sell well. And obviously it's something I'm very passionate about because it's been so effective for us. Literally, it's how we've managed to turn around every single business we've ever owned. Plus as an advisor for high net worths in turning around businesses, um, it's the number one strategy I use when I get people to turn around businesses. So we, we also help people, you know, sell businesses real quick, like, and turn them. So you got to turn them out around real fast. When I say real fast, it's normally 12 months, but the number one strategy I, I get them to implement is sales. 
It's always increasing the sales. Same with websites. As you buy one, we want to get the sales up. So it's very yeah. American, I know. And I know it's hard for um, us British kind of background people to come at, but the the Americans have got it right. You've yeah. got to sell. They, they use a word, it's a pretty crude term, but hustle, hustle, hustle. And, you know, sadly, that's what works. Well, not sadly, yeah. it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's just a crude way of wording that I suppose. It just takes some getting used to. I mean, if you weren't brought up, like yeah. in my upbringing, I was taught that sales was kind of seedy and yep, same. Um, yeah, and not yeah. It, it wasn't something that was a necessity for business. But yep. I mean, when you reframe it in the sense that like everyone needs to sell, no matter who you are. Like when you go to a job interview, you're selling yourself. You're trying to get those That's people true. to hire you. Yeah. So um, sales is all around. And if you just change that reframe and that you can learn those sales it skills can... and apply them to any aspect of your life. I mean, and it's so important. I, I think you just touched on something really important there. I was the same. I, I come from a, a, you know, it, we're not American, obviously, we're British background here. And we're the same. We're brought up that salespeople are pushy and, and you know, like very Ameri like very overbearing or whatever and, and you know, and, and kind of sometimes slightly dodgy and all that sort of stuff. And I think that's really, really dangerous thinking if you want to be rich and be blunt about it because it, all the wealthy people I know, and I know some very high net worths, they can all sell. Absolutely. And they're not shy to. That's, yeah. that's the important thing. I think if you... So I had to overcome that a lot. I did a lot of, in this 20 year journey of getting good at sales and stuff, I had to do a lot of mindset work around those sorts of things. Like, you know, and a lot of work around confidence. Am I confident enough? Because it scared, I'll, I'll be honest, it scared the, the, the CRAP out of me getting in front of that Honda CEO. Now, luckily, luckily for me, he was a super nice guy and he really liked Liz and I, and he gave us a leg up. But, um, you know, it, I had to work a lot on confidence and this idea of overcoming those subconscious blockages around, you know, sales people are dodgy and all that sort of stuff. I think now these days you can see, I love it. It's the number one thing. And that's why I want to reiterate, if you're listening to this and you're young, put aside some time somewhere, just read even a couple of books, go and read Tommy Hopkins, Art of Closing the Sale. That'll do you. Watch a couple of Zig Ziglar videos. Will this make you laugh? He's happy. Um, you know, just spend a couple of hours here and there learning how to sell or understanding the basis of what, how sales works. And then literally what we do online, really when you think about it, online is just a virtual version of how sales work. So yeah. that's how we renovate sales pages on, on websites and stuff like that. Because we're so good at sales, it's easy. Yeah. Awesome. And, um, at the beginning, you mentioned like it was really tough and quite slow over like a 10 year period. Um, yep. Was it, or did you ever compare yourself to others, like the people in the nine to five earning a steady salary? Was that tough? All for the you? time, Byron. <laughs> it was <laughs> super tough. Everyone, including family, would say, What the hell are you two doing? Because we had no money, none whatsoever. Like literally every last cent would go back into the business. And we had friends who went to uni, they got jobs, they had security, they earned good money. Um, you know, they'd go on holidays, they had nice cars. We had none of that. We always had secondhand cars. We'd buy them from the government auctions. Um, you know, we needed vehicles for our business, but it sucked. So we did, yes. I would like, I'd love to say, nah, we'd never compared ourselves. We always did. So secretly, yes, we did. And it, and it was really painful. We had friends who were, you know, all, all very high achievers, so they're earning serious sums of money. And we looked at that and went, oh, man, I could, should I get a job or whatever? But so, yeah, that, that, that bit's really tough when you're an entrepreneur. And also, Byron, it's a really smart question. Comparing ourselves to other successful entrepreneurs, that was kind of an interesting one because we deliberately put ourselves with successful entrepreneurs. Now, we viewed them as our mentors. So it was, that was actually pretty cool. It was good. But these days, I think one of the challenges is it's very easy, even now for myself, I look online and I see these YouTube entrepreneurs, you know, making 50 mil a year and stuff, and you can't help but compare yourself to them. Like it, it sometimes you think, oh, I should step up my game or whatever. Um, you know, or they're making, understand there's a lot of 
some of those people aren't really making that sort of money, you know, but, and also <laughs> I've got to admit, we're guilty of as well. We interview friends of ours and, you know, people on our digital investor podcast, there's some very, very successful high net worth online business owners there. And what we say to our clients is, look, we share those stories with you and our own stories as well to inspire you. Don't compare yourself to these guys. You're not those people at this point, but use them as role models and a focus of what you could achieve. And so that was always been our thing. We've always compared ourselves to other really successful entrepreneurs. But what Liz and I do is we pick and choose elements of what they've done and build it into our own strategy. So we use it as inspiration. Don't, don't, we've seen some of our clients compare themselves to some of the people we interview on our podcast who are also clients of ours, really successful clients. And, you know, it's easy to fall in a trap of, oh, I'm not doing as well as them. So then you get depressed and all that sort of stuff. Go, no, 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 no. It's for inspiration. Everyone's journey is different and everyone's going through different things. But um, you, you definitely need to compare yourself to others but in a positive way, not a negative way. Yeah. Did that no, answer I think, that question for you? Yeah. I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but it's <laughs> more about comparing to other entrepreneurs. Um, it, I, I think that's an important thing. A lot of people I've spoken to have mentioned how important that is, where you surround yourself with like-minded yeah. individuals and other entrepreneurs. And if yep. they're a bit ahead of you, it sometimes you may fall into that trap of comparing yourself to others and feel bad about it yeah. but on the other on the flip side it's you can see what's attainable and if you Perfect. are conversing with those people you can see that they're very similar to you in all other aspects except they're making more money and because of that yep. it makes ach achieving that way more attainable than seeing it from the outside and then just listing a figure that they're making yeah and, and that's what we try to do here at eBusiness Institute or at, within our community, Liz and I are really well known for, and we're very open about it. That's what the Digital Investor Podcast is all about, is just inspiring stories. We're over the top about it. So if we, we celebrate all our clients' successes because luckily that's one of the keys that happened for us many years ago. We had some very cool mentors slash success stories in our lives that we could model ourselves on. And so to this day, that's what we love doing is sharing those inspirational stories from, from anywhere, but mostly it's from our own community and friends, people, online entrepreneurs that we know. So it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I think for Liz and I, it was a really important part of our journey of having role models of success and you know, that, that, that made a huge difference. And that's why podcasts like yours are so important because people, you know, in their, in their commute time or whatever, get to listen to the stories that you bring out from people that you're interviewing and for your own self, like that's why you started your podcast, wasn't it? So that yeah, you, you get exactly. out and do that, that. That's what you were telling me the other day, which is super cool. I, I love that idea. And that, that's how you learn. Like you just said, have these role models. And you can do what they've done as well. Yeah. And how important has it been doing this all with Liz for your wife? Very. She she's smarter than I am. She's really good. Um, and we drive each other. She's she's very competitive, very driven at, as I am, but in a different way. Um, so it's it has been an absolute ball. And uh, I think the sum of us two, like one plus one equals, you know, five. It's not one plus one equals two. I think with the two of us, so I've got to admit, that's been my competitive advantage in business over the years is having Liz by my side and vice versa for her as well. It makes a huge difference when you're a, a couple in business. Now, I know it's very unique. Not many people can do it. We literally work together 24-7 for 30 years. We also had to share the same sports. We race motorbikes together. She's very competitive. She's, I won't say she's a better rider than me. I nearly <laughs> did. Um, but she, but that's dirt bikes and road bikes, all that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a, we're quite unique, I would say. I don't think many people could hack what, how we do it. Like, but so literally, and our kids are the same. They do the same sports with us as well. Um, it, it, and yeah, we share the same, I think what, what, what's worked well. And if you're listening to this and you, and you're thinking, say, yeah, I'm presuming you're a bit you know, you're a younger person, you're starting on your journey and you might have a new partner is what Liz and I figured out very early was 
we had a shared vision and Liz luckily bought into my vision. So like I said at the beginning of the podcast, she wasn't that interested in financial independence, but like she always knew she was going to do well because she's smart and she can get a job anywhere and, or, you know, she'd always do well. But her thing was um, independence to do whatever she wants and live wherever she wants and raise a family. And so that was more, wasn't the money side, whereas mine was the money side. So when we got together, she bought into my vision very nicely and we had a very shared vision, which went fit like a glove together. And we both wanted the same thing. Ultimately, I wanted the money more because I grew up poor. But other than that, everything else, we it was exactly the same. We had a shared vision for how we wanted to raise kids when we have a family, but where we wanted to live in the country, the sorts of things we did as hobbies, um, how we stay fit together, you know, we train together. And also we had a shared vision in business. We both were addicted to business. And so I think if you're thinking of working with a partner, my one number one bit of advice is test them out on the vision side, do goal setting together. And that's where I think Liz and I um, knew we clicked. It, you know, it, was, it was effortless on that side. And so luckily when you are business partners, here's the big advantage is that you can figure stuff out together and you can work on those goals together. And I recommend you do. So every Monday we have a business meeting and we, and we, it's not even just every Monday, it's literally every day too. at lunch, dinner with the kids. You know, we're talking about business, where are we headed here? What's the vision? Are we on path? And that's the main thing because we're constantly, I guess, checking our feedback with each other. That's the good thing about having a partner. And if you don't have a partner, you need a coach to do that. So this is kind of been my coach and I've been her coach over the years. When you think about it, we're constantly checking in on each other. Are you on path? Am I on path? And we're working to a shared goal. And I think that's the big reason for our success. Great. And um, just one one last question um, with regards to the e-business institute. Uh, so you run yep. a whole, well, you run the e-business institute that teaches others to do the same. Yep. But from the outside yep. looking in, running a course or courses seems like a lot of work on top of acquiring online businesses. Yep. Um, so is it yep. worth it for you financially or do you just love teaching others? I'll be blunt. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't worth financially. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I'm a businessman. Every business we own has got to make a profit. So, but that wasn't the reason why we started it. We, it's funny. It's a really good question. So on the surface, yes, it's got to be worth it financially. But the real reason I do it is I, I can retire. I don't have to work if I don't want to. Um, I'm meant to be semi-retired now, but I absolutely love what we do here at eBusiness Institute. I found my passion. So I was lucky. I found my passion in life um, through eBusiness Institute. Well, my first passion was businesses and growing them and, and selling them and that sort of stuff. But then we got asked to speak at live events about what we do because it was so unique. No one else in Australia was doing it, buying and selling online businesses. So we'd get asked to speak at conferences. And then out of that, people would come up to us and say, oh, can you teach us what you do? And that's literally how we started. So we said, yeah, sure. We'll just run a course and and people signed up and love it. And then we started coaching people and I get a real buzz out of that. It is so cool because we help people quit their jobs. And so we typically help people. This is a real ch- so talk about a challenge. We, Liz and I love a challenge, right? So we don't just teach your average person how to quit their job. We're, we're talking people that earn big money. So it's a scary thing to quit a significant six-figure income, right? So that's my biggest buzz in life is helping those guys quit their jobs and start completely retraining something they've never done before, which is online businesses and make full-time money working from home. It's super cool. So that it's all mindset too. So we, we, we just love mindset now and that we, we're helping people make that transition. So very addictive for us. So yeah, I, it, it's both things. It, it's not the, I, I jokingly said it's about the finance. It's actually not. It's because we love doing what we do and we've got a really cool community. You, you think of the co- cool kind of people that we're surrounded by. Talk about positive ultra high achievers. It's just unreal. Every single person on our course is a high achiever, you know, that that's pretty cool. So we've hand select. When you think about it, we get the coolest people ever working with us. You know, we're not we're not talking your average people here. Oh yeah, that's that sounds amazing. It's like your listeners. Listen, anyone that's come this far, Byron, we've been going for an hour. Anyone that's come this yeah. far, you know that you you guys, like hats off to you. You you're way beyond ninety five percent of the population. Most people are happy just go to work, come home, have a few beers, watch Netflix, go to bed, whatever. 
anyone listening to a podcast like this, that's who I love helping because you want to make a change in your life. You're going to get off your butt and do something. That's who we want to help. And that that's that that keeps me young. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Um, and to end every conversation, I actually hand over the mic and ask if you have a question for me. Wow. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I got a question. What do you want to do? Like with with, with the, are you allowed to say it publicly? I don't know. Maybe you want to quit your job or whatever, but but um, what what what's your goal? Do you want to build something out of this podcast and and build it into another online business or something? Uh, yes. So the intention is to grow the listenership enough that I could possibly advertise on this podcast. Oh, um, yep. And Good. um, because of the nature of the podcast and the topics I discussed, I think there is an opportunity for possibly courses or things like yep. that um or something similar to you i'd like i don't know that's yep. still up in the air but uh, i mean early stage entrepreneurship is an interesting niche and it's something i'm interested in yeah, so sure. i feel like um speaking to many guests and building up like a catalog uh creates the opportunity to go in a few interesting different directions and so i have every intention to do that i just haven't really landed on a direction yet so it's smart what you're doing byron anyone listening you know you, this way listening to byron's podcast is because it's what Liz and i call data gathering so that's one of the strategies we've used throughout our life is we create we call it the smorgasbord of life so we talk to as many entrepreneurs as we possibly can and we learn off them and then we create our own strategy and that's how we ended up where we are today doing what we do and that's what we teach and so you're doing a similar thing with your podcast when you think about it you're not quite sure yet, that's perfectly fine, but you've got a a bit of a vision there of of somewhere you want to do something with this, but the moment you're getting all these ideas off all these really cool guests that you have on your podcast, and then Byron, you have to execute on it. That's the number one thing. Look, this is my keypad. See what that says? There's GSD. You know what that stands for? Get shit done. And (laughs) our kids are big, that's the number plate of our car as well. It is literally (laughs) GSD. You got to execute. Yeah, and that's what that's what that's what we do. And our kids have learnt that, and they're they're blitzing it. So it's the same thing in our family. It's always GSD. When they were little, we didn't let them swear, but now they're they're my daughter's eighteen. She's allowed to say what what it, <laughs> you say. Get Amazing. stuff done. <laughs> but it, yeah, but it works. So if you listen to this, get all these ideas, but make sure you get stuff done at some point. You got to execute. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you for joining me today, Matt. I really enjoyed our conversation. Awesome. If people want to find out more yeah. about eBusiness Institute Australia or the Digital Investors yep. Podcast and everything else you're working on, where can they do so? So you can just Google my name, Matt Rad, and you'll find the eBusiness, it's a mouthful, eBusinessInstitute.com.au. We set it up many years ago. It is an institute for training people in digital skills. But you can also, like Byron mentioned, you can look up our Digital Investors Podcast as well, where you'll see a whole bunch of inspirational stories about people who buy and sell websites. And we do have a free masterclass training that is a webinar that you can do where we show you the sorts of sites we buy and how we do it so we go into a lot more detail than what we're able to cover today as well you just check that out on the e-business institute there's links all there for that too great thanks for joining me matt and chat soon no worries byron thanks so much for having me on thanks for listening i really appreciate you making it all the way to the end i hope you enjoyed the episode one more quick reminder before you go i have a weekly newsletter by the same name, another excuse, where I cover four topics, something that has changed my perception, a tool that could be useful to you, content that is actually worth consuming, and a concept that I try break down and explain. If this sounds of any interest to you and you need a kick up the ass, then you can subscribe at the link below. Thanks for joining me again and I'll see you next week. 